tiny living robots that travel your system and repair wounds? Sounds like sci-fi, but it might be closer to reality than you think. Stay tuned. Hey there, welcome to Science Is You. We're a new and growing channel dedicated to making real biotechnology research available, accessible, and fun for everyone. To support our mission, please subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks for watching. If you like sci-fi films, I bet you've seen at least one show where a fleet of some sort of tiny robots or nanoscale something was administered to someone with severe injuries or illness to travel their body and heal them internally. Can you believe such ideas aren't limited to the theater, but are actually being explored as part of real cutting-edge biotechnology research? Today, we're going to take a look at the incredible research reported in this actual scientific study. Here, the researchers were experimenting with so-called biological robots or biobots. This sounds crazy, but biological machines have long been in existence. If you think about it, all biological organisms bacteria, plants, cells, and even the human body could be considered machines, except instead of containing nuts and bolts, they contain DNA, proteins, and other special biological molecules that enable them to perform different functions. But what if we could harness the abilities of different biologics to function in new ways, like heal wounds throughout the body, repair brain damage, kill cancer cells, or deliver medications to specific organs? So what is a biobot? A biobot is made up of some sort of living material like bacteria or other cells held together somehow and designed to perform a specific function. But wouldn't it be even better if they could self-assemble so we don't have to piece them together artificially? The scientists who wrote this paper created what they call anthrobots, so-called because they are made out of human cells. They describe these as a fully biological, self-constructing, mobile living structures created out of a type of human lung cells. Here's what they did. The researchers here grew a type of human airway cell to form the anthrobots. But why would they choose these cells? Well, any good biological robot should be able to move around on its own. Cells in human airways have special structures on them called cilia. These are projections on the outside of the cell, sort of like fins that enable cells to move and swim. Now, cells in the lung don't really swim, of course, but in stationary cells, these cilia take on a different role. Cilia pointing out into the lung in airspace can help push debris and mucus out of the airways. So what happens if we take human lung cells out of the airway? In the lab, the researchers formed clusters of these cells called spheroids. The idea that the cilia these cells naturally possess would enable them to move and swim on their own. But there's one issue. Visualize the human lung. It isn't just a dense ball of cells. There's an open space for the air surrounded by cells. It's basically a hollow ball of cells. This hollow space in an organ is called the lumen. So if we zoom in, the cells actually have a direction. They're sitting on some surface, usually other cells or some sort of tissue, and facing upward into an open space. This upward direction into the open cavity is called the apical side, and the bottom is called basal. You might hear the fancy sounding term apico-basal polarity, which essentially just means what direction the cell is facing. Cells have a phenomenal capability to organize into structures on their own. So when the researchers created spheroids out of these airway cells, the cells organized themselves into a hollow ball with all of the cilia facing insides and none on the outside. In order for the biobots to be able to swim, they would need to have the cilia on the outside, of course. A huge part of what causes cells to organize into different structures and change their shape and behaviors is external conditions, including not only chemicals and molecules surrounding the cells, but also the physical surroundings, like the types of materials the cells are growing in. The scientists here tweaked the conditions they were growing the spheroids in until they found conditions that resulted in the cells organizing into what they call apical out structures or inside out structures with the cilia on the outside. One of the main changes they made was varying the type of substance they were growing the cells in, transitioning them from a thick gel-like substance called matrigel to growing directly in liquid. 
They observed that these spheroids with cilia on the outside could move and swim on their own. These mobile structures took about a week to form, so pretty quick. These so-called anthrobots could swim in different directions, straight ahead or in circular patterns, or wiggle around in place. Pretty cool. But the authors were curious how these anthrobots would behave around other cells. They set up something called a scratch assay, which is a way of mimicking injury to a sheet of cells growing in a dish. Here's how it works. Cells in a petri dish grow by dividing. These form small groups of cells called colonies that grow larger and larger. Eventually, cells will cover the entire surface of the dish, forming a continuous sheet of cells. To perform the scratch assay, this layer of cells is literally scratched with a razor blade or scalpel. Then it can be studied how the cells grow back together to heal the scratch. Here, the authors did scratch assays using neuronal cells. They wanted to see how the anthrobots behaved in a scenario that was completely different from the lung, where the biobots originally came from. Also, healing hard to repair organs like brain tissue would be a fantastic potential application for the anthrobots. So they placed the bots on the neuronal scratch and then watched what happened. They observed that the bots moved along and within the scratch. The researchers then wanted to see though how the anthrobots affected the injured neuronal cells near the scratch site. Now, the authors didn't provide a whole lot of reasoning for why they did what they did next, but it was pretty interesting. They mentioned that they were inspired by collective behavior in nature and how groups or swarms can accomplish tasks that individuals alone can't. So they didn't just observe the actions of single anthrobots, but instead they clustered the anthrobots into what they call superbot assemblies. They then put these clusters of multiple bots into the scratch and looked at what happened. These superbot clusters were larger and could span the width of the scratch, forming sort of a bridge. Surprisingly, after a few days, they observed regrowth of the neuronal cells directly underneath the superbot bridges. They didn't see any regrowth at other locations along the scratch, so it wasn't just a coincidence. Even more striking was that the regrown tissue was just as thick as the uninjured cell layer. But was this really a unique phenomenon of the super anthrobots? Or could any material just form a bridge to aid neuronal cell repair? So they tried putting agarose, a jelly-like substance that cells can grow in, at different sites along the scratch. And no neuronal tissue regrew. So it seems that somehow these biobot collectives are enabling the regrowth of neurons. But what happens to the anthrobots after the neurons heal? The authors report that the lifespan of the bots is around four to six weeks and then they just disintegrate. So when can we expect to inject anthrobots into people to heal brain injury? Well, these experiments were very cool, but also very early in the research process. For instance, the scratch assay is certainly relevant to study how cells behave, but extremely simplified compared to what happens in the body. Neurons growing on plastic is a very different situation from neurons growing in the brain. In the body, there are multiple cell types, including immune cells, that are involved in injury processes. Also, exactly how the anthrobots enabled the neuron regrowth in the dish isn't fully understood. It could be they're secreting some sort of substance that the neurons are growing on, but it wasn't yet explored in this study. Are there perhaps other cell types that the anthrobots can be made from that would work even better? Also, how exactly should the anthrobots be introduced into the body? It's easy enough to put them into a scratch in a petri dish, but in the body there are many places that the bots might potentially travel. How do we target them to specific sites within a scratch or injury within the body? And could they cause harm if they contact sites in the body other than intended? What do you think? Do biobots have potential as an actual medical treatment? Share in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share with your friends to help out our mission of making real biotechnology research accessible and fun for everyone. And remember, 